Well, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Rob Hegley. I'm a professor of medicine at uh, Western University in London, Ontario. And I'm going to be talking about the new genetics of uh, dyslipidemia and uh, treatment. So these are my disclosures. And really, there's uh, two main objectives for the next few minutes. So I'm going to be talking about uh, new insights into the diagnosis and treatment of hypercholesterolemia, and then insights into the diagnosis and treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. So uh, through the ages, uh, so this is then, uh, in fact, when I graduated from medical school in 1981, uh, this is the state of knowledge of familial hypercholesterolemia, that it was a one in 500 disease that had autosomal dominant inheritance, and it was primarily the LDL receptor. There's certain clinical features. You made the diagnosis based on clinical grounds, and then the treatment was you know, diet, lifestyle, and actually statins were still years away from being introduced. So there was, um, and then you know, apheresis as well. If we flash forward to now 40 years later, uh, our, uh, it, it really is amazing as to how, how much our knowledge has evolved. So first of all, the, the disease is more prevalent than we thought. The genetics is quite complicated, uh, much more complicated than we thought, many causative genes. Uh, there's also polygenic risk, which is an important factor. Clinical features are pretty much the same. We, we now use DNA in the diagnosis and we have all of these treatments, many, many more treatments, so I'm going to some of, the, some of which that I will mention in my talk. Same with severe hypertriglyceridemia. So back in the day, we used to think it was like this. So these are like triglycerides over 10 or over 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. We used to think this was like a super rare uh, condition, and it was like, you know, uh, primarily uh, uh, Mendelian, you know, autosomal recessive. And there were two genes, lipoprotein lipase, and then also from the work from St. Michael's Hospital, even in those days, you know, APOC2 was known as a causative gene. And the clinical features that you, that you see there, and then the diagnosis was clinical, and then the control, there really was not a lot that could be done. It's, it's now amazing, you know, 40 years later. First of all, we realize that it's much more prevalent, at least, you know, so, uh, now the, it's the polygenic form. <laughs> Most patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia actually have polygenic hypertriglyceridemia. There are some uh, Mendelian genes. Uh, clinical features are the same, but in fact, we're now starting to have, or on the, we're on the verge of having many more treatments for this. So um, you may have remembered from medical school the Fredrickson classification. So this is now, I think, been superseded by this, this sort of simpler classification where we look at the main lipid disturbance. Is it an LDL problem? Is it a triglyceride problem? Or is it combined? Is it like combined LDL and triglycerides? Uh, or is it an HDL problem? And then is, you know, is the uh, elevation, is it mild to moderate or is it more severe? So that's how this, uh, how this slide is broken down in, in terms of then the, the quality and the, qu the quantitative aspects of the disturbance. Uh, for the mild to moderate elevations, those are often related to secondary factors. If there is a genetic component, it's usually a polygenic component. But for the severe elevations, so the you know, familial hypercholesterolemia, LDL above 5 or triglycerides above 10, there were a, a larger proportion of those are monogenic uh, or stronger polygenic predisposition with secondary factors. And so then these can be actually... Uh, in terms of the monogenic, the single gene disorders, there's actually 25 named disorders. The most famous is familial hypercholesterolemia. Then there's like familial, familial chylomicronemia syndrome on the triglyceride side. There's 25 disorders, 25 genes that can be organized this way. And they have a range of clinical features which are shown in this slide, depending on whether the primary disturbance is high LDL or low LDL or high triglyceride or uh, low HDL states. Uh, these are the, the f clinical features that you read about in a medical textbook. So those are the monogenic, but in fact more common is polygenic, uh, especially for triglycerides. So for polygenic, for in, in monogenic illnesses, it is a single mutation in a single gene that fully explains the phenotype. For polygenic disorders, we, it's really small effect common variants that then cumulatively add up 
they each incrementally raise the lipid a little bit. In this example, it's LDL. So these are common variants that we all have. You know, usually we have a balance, some raise, some lower, but some people get a preponderance where every time they're always getting the variant that slightly raises their LDL and then puts them into the range where it looks like they have a single gene mutation. So when we're diagnosing these now, we need to be aware of the two types. We need to have a methodology that will detect the monogenic and the polygenic. Um, and then this is then when, we, when we've actually then um, broken it down diagnostically. For familial hypercholesterolemia, patients referred to my clinic, about 53% will have a single gene variant, so classic FH or related gene. Another 13% will have polygenic uh, hypercholesterolemia. The other third, we're still uh, trying to figure out why their cholesterol is high. For triglycerides, it's different. For triglycerides, only a minority have, like literally 1.1% have the autosomal recessive Mendelian form, 14% are heterozygous, the majority are actually polygenic. So triglyceride is different. Triglyceride is not as strictly classically genetic as you think of, whereas FH is more like you know, what you learn about in, in classical genetics uh, textbooks. Um, so the good news is we now have a bunch of new treatments that can bring down LDL levels, bring down triglyceride levels, bring them both down. can also help to treat LP little a. We can do this through targeting RNA. We can do it through monoclonal antibodies. So the ideal target is something whose levels are high, are associated with risk. When you then knock the levels down, that lowers the risk. It improves the metabolic profile. And so the, you know, these uh, various agents uh, are listed on this slide, summarized here. So there are agents that lower PCSK9 and lower LDL, both monoclonal antibodies and SI interference, uh, so interfer RNA interfering drugs. Uh, uh, ANGPTL3, that if you lower that, it lowers both triglycerides and lowers LDL. Uh, LP little a, you can lower through targeting the, uh, the RNA of, of the APO uh, little a uh, message. And uh, APOC3 get profound reductions in triglycerides for those patients with very, very high triglyceride levels. So all of these drugs are in various uh, stages of clinical development, the RNA interference drugs, and we're in a very uh, exciting period where, where these are now uh, being uh, developed and uh, available in clinical trials. So in summary, uh, the dyslipidemias, you can think of them uh, rather than those Fredrickson types, it's either, you know, is it an LDL problem, is it a triglyceride problem, is it a combined, or is it one of the other, uh, one of the other dyslipidemias. There, uh, when, you, when we list them, there's 25 genes, 25 disorders. The severe LDL increase is more often mo monogenic than polygenic. The triglyceride increase is way more often polygenic compared to monogenic. And we know that then the atherogenic lipids, LDL, uh, non-HDL, uh, moderate hypertriglyceridemia, LP little a, they all raise cardiovascular risk. Severe hypertriglyceridemia raises pancreatitis risk. And we now have a number of ready for prime time RNA knockdown platforms, either through RNA interference or uh, so short interfering RNA or ASO in addition to our monoclonal antibodies. So thanks very, very much for your attention and thanks for the opportunity to speak at this amazing symposium.